Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast, where we demystify the creative process and exchange ideas with career-minded artists. We are your hosts, Adriana May and Jackie Sanders. We're two emerging artists sharing forward the advice and business lessons we have learned along our journey. So if you're not already, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you'll be notified when we launch a new episode every week. Today's episode, we're really excited to welcome our guest, Maria Brito. She is an award-winning New York-based contemporary arts advisor, author, and curator. She is a Harvard graduate, originally from Venezuela, whose projects have been featured extensively in national and international publications. She has curated exhibitions in three continents, and in 2009, she created and hosted The Sea Files with Maria Brito, a TV and streaming series for PBS news station, All Art. One of, uh, one of her most recent endeavors is publishing her book, How Creativity Rules the World, that launches today at the time that this podcast is released, March 15th, 2022. Maria, welcome to the podcast. We're so delighted you're here with us. Thank you, Adriana and Jackie. I'm so happy to be here. It's such an honor that we are getting together in this impressive date, finally, after three yes. years working on this project, <laughs> it sees the light. So thank you. And thank you, everyone who's listening. I hope you have a very good time with us today. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. And of course, we're going to dive deep into your book and the amazing resource that it is for other artists. But real quick, you clearly have a very successful career up until this point and a bright future ahead. But how did you get started in the art world? Did you always know <laughs> that you wanted to be involved in the arts? Like, take us back a little bit on how you got into it. Ah, uh, no, no. I had a lot of detours. And, you know, I uh, was born and raised in Venezuela, like you guys said in my introduction. And I uh, grew up in this family that did not believe in artistic endeavors as a profession. They thought it was a great thing for me to be cultivated and nurtured through the arts because I'm sure my mom was like priming me to marry like a prince or something and that. <laughs> Like I was going to like convince the dude that I was so smart because I knew so much about art. But the truth is that I actually have that to acknowledge to my parents that they made an effort to take me to museums and galleries and artist studios when I was really young and uh, plays. And we really didn't have a lot of money, but the money that was left, it was usually for trips or, cul or cultural activities, which I certainly love and appreciate because it was my training on the go. And while in high school, I did a uh, tremendous concentration in humanities and uh, I, you know, loved everything that had to do with art. I was a singer myself, but my also mother decided that was for hookers. So, oh no. She, yeah. So, so she stopped everything because when it was like festivals and the school play and whatever, it was all fun. But when people came with like contracts for like record labels and when I was invited to tour in bands and whatever, she's like, no, over my dead body. So <laughs> it's super funny right now, but it's quite tragic if you think about that, you know, a teenager was kind of like ripped from her dream. And uh, I think that ever since I was like maybe 12 or perhaps before, my mother and my dad too were like, you know, in this house, you're going to be an attorney, a doctor, or an engineer, right? Like, depending yes. on careers and the things like, you know, you also have to understand the context, right? Like, this is the 1980s or 1990s in Venezuela, super conservative, everything is backwards, right? Like, I mean, there was no other option. So, Thing that I could not pursue my path. I went to law school and I graduated and I moved to the States, um, you know, to go to Harvard Law. And when I graduated, I moved to New York because I obviously I had already like been there and graduated and I, I took the bar exam and I wanted to practice law because after all that time, right, I mean, it was the right thing to do. And I did actually for nine years, hating, hating it with all my might. But it's one of those things that you at the beginning say, well, I'm not yet used to it and it's going to get better and, uh, oh God, you know, and it, it, I mean, it never happened, right? 
And in the meantime, because I had already had all that background, I went to all the galleries in New York and the museums in my spare time, which was honestly very little coming from a law firm, big law firm, and the art fair. And I was certainly fascinating, fascinated by, by, look, at that time, we're talking about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, the it was a very different world. There was no Instagram. Social media was just starting. Um, you know, you had to go gallery to gallery, person to person, you know, kind of like you couldn't really know what was happening. Seriously, you would have to go and buy art form, which was written in Russian, basically. I mean, nobody understood that magazine. It's like <laughs> gibberish, right? That was kind of like the only source. And the other thing is like you go and you walk and you do your own thing. and. I, and that's why, you know, I, I became so intrigued about the idea, how do I get into this world by demystifying it, right? And sort of like opening it up to general public and uh, teaching them how to collect and how to live with art the same way I had been building my own art collection too. I worked and I worked so hard, but I, I really wanted to have my own collection. And so... It's like a bunch of interests that converged in my life at the same time. And since I hated being an attorney and I had just had a baby, my first child, I said to myself, you know, I am not going to waste my life at a law firm anymore because I am sad, I'm depressed, and I don't want to teach my child to do something that, you know, like follow the the." of a mother who hates her career and I'm going to teach him something different. So I quit and I opened this art advisory without having really many contacts in the art world, just a handful of people and without having any clients or anything. And so it was a humongous risk. And um, I mean, and a crazy thing to do, really, the truth is, but I was following my intuition and I was also following the uh, research that I had done and the blind spots that I saw and how everything was so mysterious, right, for the layman and how difficult the information was to put together. And, you know, I started blogging when nobody else was blogging about art exhibitions and art fairs. Again, like we had some publications like Artnet and uh, Art Forum, but they were not easily accessible. And they never really kind of like spoke to people in a friendly way. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do it because nobody is doing it. And like no art advisory is actually doing this either. And I am pretty sure that this space is ripe and um, it's ready for me to take it. And that is how it all started. And, you know, I can guarantee you that nobody was doing what I was doing. Like now, I mean, it's great. Everybody copies me and that's cool. I mean, I find that's just a sign of flattery, really, honestly. Now everybody's an art advisor. Now everybody does everything on it. So it's like, I'm like, I'm cool with it, you know? But like, I did this 13 years ago when you were not even like in high school. You know I mean? <laughs> Especially thinking back then, like you were saying, like 2007, 2008, to put it in context for, yeah, some of our younger yeah. listeners, like that's right when... Facebook was really even starting to spread. And that was back when it was still limited to like, you needed yeah. <laughs> you type email address. So think right. actually just that accessibility of information um, and your blog becoming kind of that source, especially within New York, having that ripe information, your perspective on collections or local artists, I'm sure becoming that database is almost like a foreign concept this day and age. Because like you were saying, everyone's opinions or everyone's yeah. weekend plans are out for the world to see. <laughs> right. no matter what see but that wasn't the case in no. the past. No, 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 no. And, and obviously this served a purpose, which was to get the message to the world, but also it helped me establish all this relationship with artists that I was intrigued. I wondered how they did their things, where their ideas came from, what was their process. And, you know, I have been to like more than 400 studios, really. Like, it's a big number. And I am still fascinated, fascinated by the creative process and the alchemy, right? Like what happens inside of studios because each artist has their way of doing things 
and their point of view and like i've learned so much i mean literally everything right like from them but this was really an excellent and it was not an excuse it was something that i from the bottom of my heart wanted to do for them and for the audiences but also because you know i was genuinely intrigued by their worlds right and so one thing led to the other and then you know next thing is like magazines are asking me to contribute articles and then next thing is like so because since nobody else was doing it and i was gaining traction right people started coming to talk to me because i knew how to explain things in terms that anybody could understand <laughs> and not, you know in Artsy. this kind of like well yeah like you know sanskrit or whatever those publications <laughs> you know Oh, like the way yeah <laughs> you're like the voice of like the common man so to yes, speak. Being a collector yourself and a part of the culture but also clearly very educated in it growing up in that world as a educated observer of it so you almost could translate from their language understand it to what does that mean for someone who's looking to buy their first piece of artwork or why should i care about this artist and then you can communicate that to them yeah and a separate kind of sideline to that that would be i mean it would be a wonderful conversation for another episode it's how you were able to move past what you know i'd like to think of as the hispanic uh ah, yes if you will because i grew up in puerto rico and it was the same way you can go to the museum you can do art on the side but to pursue it as a career not really lawyers <laughs> doctors everything else which i totally get they're obviously looking you know out for you but i'm glad you were able to move past that and not only did you you know move to a different country <laughs> same <laughs> But also being able to like move past the having a nice, wonderful, safe, well-paying job to say, actually, you know what, art is really what I'm passionate about. And not only that, how can I make a business out of it? Or how can I communicate and fill in this void that you were seeing, but still working in something that you were passionate about? So it's it's just amazing i just wanted to kind of point that out <laughs> thank you it's amazing and i think that you've um i mean when, once you have seen things in your life and you're like okay i tried this is something that i did to let's say establish a foundation when i went to the law firms and i worked you know there as an attorney and i also did what my parents wanted me to do and at some point i was like you know what it's time right now to please myself and to do what i want to do and i have absolutely no doubt that i am going to be happier and better off because I'm going to really put my energy into things that I am passionate about and not just like going with emotions, doing something for somebody else. There is nothing wrong with being an attorney. The truth is, right? I mean, we, and we need them. But that was not for me. It was just absolutely not for me. And I found no desire to be a part of that lifestyle at all, right? And uh, I understand, like, again, like you said, my parents meant well. But they didn't understand me, you know? Yeah. And I think that's great to like take that courage of recognizing, okay, this worked for a certain period of time. It got me to this point, but it's not necessarily going to be my future and like rewriting that narrative. So of course, starting in New York City, writing your blog. Now let's fast forward a bit to today. What does your career look like now? And what's the main focus to how you can um, share your experience with fellow artists? my job really is to be the eyes and ears of my clients the art collectors and to help them diversify their assets through art but also to curate their collections so that it makes sense for them what they are acquiring so things speak to each other right i mean every collector and every client has a different perspective on what they want to have on their walls the things that they want to spend money on the things that they want to live with and it takes a certain art right of uh, learning their taste is so that you're not wasting your time or they're showing them things that don't have anything to do so there is a lot of intuition and there is a lot of pattern recognition too in this job because you know you want to advocate you're you know i'm, I'm it, it, this is also a business of you know advocacy i'm advocating for galleries i'm advocating for artists but i'm also represent this is what sometimes trips people up 
at the end of the day, I'm representing clients, right? And I have to do the best that's for them. I, like, I, I have to get all this artists asking me can you represent me and that's not really my job the galleries represent the artists and i am in the middle but of course you know i've done a ton of different projects with artists because since i opened a business that allowed me to be myself i did not want to be circumscribed by a box that says and this is what you do right so <laughs> i have yeah i mean that's ridiculous so i've curated shows around the world i have worked with artists in product collaborations because at some point i got the bug that i wanted to get into manufacturing so i did a ton of collaborations with artists for products and limited editions um you know i've launched courses online i've written you know like i wrote my book i continue to do a lot of social media now i have a weekly newsletter called the groove and i love it because it intertwines topics of creativity business art and all the things that i feel are relevant for me as i am today and the important thing is that I, for me evolution is something extraordinarily important and that is something that i appreciate from artists from business people too right like i'm not the same person i was 13 years ago i'm not the same person i was 20 years ago and if i were that means that life just passed by me and i just didn't learn anything right yeah. so what so I, I, my desire is to continue shifting to meet the world where it is, not the world of 2008, but the world yeah. of, you know, like right now, 2022, and to also fulfill my ambitions, my spirit, my desires, right? I don't want to do anything that is like an imposition or an obligation. The, any business owner will always tell you that there is a lot of drudgeries and things and boring things and whatever and you know there is no escaping that there's no and um, but that's not how the majority of my time is spent right and so i'm glad that i can take projects that are different and it's funny because people sometimes and at the, at the beginning it would make me mad but then i was laughing like people would say but what what do you do you know <laughs> like what don't you do actually <laughs> Like, I'm like, you know, sometimes I, I'm just, I, I feel like, depending on who asks, right, I don't even want to answer or whatever, right? Like, I was like, okay, okay, you know, sort of like deflect. Um, but, but I think that it's, right, it's so funny. I remember once when I did the project, you know, the collaborations with artists, we launched so many of them. And then was this woman, I thought you were the lady who did handbags with artists. I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh my god you know what i was like yeah i mean i just didn't even want to talk to her because i mean like i, I was like people with that level of narrow-mindedness don't deserve my answers honestly right. like it blows their mind that you could be more than one thing yeah, oh my god. yeah. i mean it's like who, who does she think she is you know like who does she <laughs> think she is to have her hand on all these things and why she does that here's the deal and i for anybody who's listening regardless of what you do the trick honestly of creativity and innovation is to always be two steps three or four or five ahead of what everybody else is doing because as i'm telling you everybody copied me and i'm okay with that right like i mean it, it just it became really difficult for them because the artist wouldn't give them the same access that they gave me because when you are the first you are the first right the second third fourth and fifth it's not that exciting anymore and the artists don't have time to open the doors of their studios all the time for these people right but the thing is when anybody or everybody is trying to catch up to you you're already <laughs> doing seven other things right like because that is actually the realm of an artist is to think beyond what's been given right to expand whatever your practice is in your ideas way far outside of the borders of what people told you that you could or that you should do and in that sense i identify identify with artists tremendously because we think in the same way like i don't want to be known as just a transactional person who gets paid for placing artworks in collections i think my my vision my mission is a whole lot bigger than that and i think that i feel connected to greater ideas that can impact the world and not in a philosophical way because i hate that bullshit too like <laughs> when the 
the answer is so high level and so kind of like impossible to grasp and bring to the world. Right. You know, people who feel so qualified to talk about shit and they have never worked a day in their lives, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're not even saying anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah just like, honestly, let's get some yeah, like, oh, yeah. like the, you know, oh, the critics. I mean, like, the, what? Like, people who are behind of a screen just writing words meaningless and like, dude, like, no. So, you know, I feel that's like so, that's what's so cool about what you do is because like you're going into artist studios, you're going and meeting them, you're going to these openings and gallery openings. So it's you're not just sitting in your skyrise office <laughs> writing a letter about one pe one image that you saw on your no, computer. I just like can't part of that experience, which I think is what yeah. Really and and I'm telling you, I mean, it's yeah. gonna like for for the artists who are listening or the greatest who are listening this always will ruffle feathers every time you take a different path or try to experiment with a different medium some people are going to love it some people are going to hate it but at the end of the day how do you evolve how do you take that step forward in your growth in your career and profession and as a human being if you are stay you know if you stay stuck in the same things you were doing 30 years ago 20 years ago 10 years ago <laughs> right how uh, boring and how limiting that is so i mean for the haters love you baby you know <laughs> <laughs> well that actually is a perfect segue um kind of following up on something that you brought up with your experience with all the artists and i definitely love this part about evolve be three steps ahead or 10 steps ahead of Maybe someone that would try to copy you because by the time they copy you, you're already, you know, on the next level anyway. So who cares? You just kind of leave them behind. But that does bring me to the question of, okay, so, you know, for our artist listeners, right? How would you, how can an artist present themselves in such a way that they would stand out to a curator, to a gallery owner, to an art consultant such as yourself? Where they're like okay they're already trying to push the envelope so that's fantastic obviously we're not talking about folks doing mainstream stuff sorry um, <laughs> that's not going to stand out that much but what can an artist do that will just you go wait a minute i need to talk to this person i need to go to their studio i need to get a piece from their collection i need to know their story like is there anything that artists can do that just like just it just catches you you know i think that that there, there is always this consistent thought in my mind, and I wrote about this in my book, which is the difference between having a talent for something and having a creative and innovative mind, right? Because the two things are very different. And there are incredible artists who have never painted anything in their lives because they have a studios with a bunch of people, right? And they actually are idea makers and they say, this is what I need. Or they call a fabricator in Germany who is creating this, you know, sculptures that are super perfect and whatnot, right? So that is a way that is, you know, about ideas that sometimes impacts more than the person who is, let's say, hyper realist who can reproduce a photograph to the extent that it looks like a photograph and those are really incredible skills right and there might be a lot of stories behind it but then you don't necessarily feel that connected because it's too perfect right like i think that we are past the area of perfection and the, uh the pursuit of those things i think that artists who want to stand out have to really embrace their stories to begin with because every story is different there are seven billion of seven billion human beings in the world and let's say there are you know five million artists i don't know like i don't have that number right and each one of them has a very different story to tell is a different upbringing is a different family it's a different uh, school or if no school is your path towards where you are and um i think that a lot of artists also get confused and it's okay obviously to emulate parts of the things that you lo love about your art heroes right and whether they are in art history or contemporary but i think that when i don't see enough of the artist it's for me it's a little bit of a, of a turn off because I, then it, I can't relate, right? Like I can't connect to something that is 
a knockoff or is, is, is an idea that I have already seen it way too many times. And you know, that comes with like the desire to be authentic and the desire to, you know, uh, express uh, something that's not being spoken up about. That's very important, right? Like when, when people are silent about something, that means that you, if you feel connected about uh, on some sort of like mission or if you have a particular story to tell then we want to hear it from you so i'm not sure why some artists censor that right i mean like sometimes they are like well maybe the world is not ready the world is ready for everything i mean we're yeah. way you know ahead of those type of things and uh, but you know everybody has to understand that they have exceptionally good points and also terrible points right like, i mean it's, it's like <laughs> yeah, i mean that, that self-assessment has to be very honest and a lot of people you know feel that well, when you're like just banging uh, your head against the wall for too long with something that's a, that's an indication you have to shift right i mean it doesn't mean you have to stop being an artist but it has maybe what you're exploring right now is not necessarily what the world wants and the sooner you make those shifts and the more attuned you are to who like the person you are in your reality the more opportunities and the more positive reactions you're going to find outside of what you're doing and obviously marketing is a is a creative skill and is a very important one I think long gone are the times where artists were just in the studio behind, you know, like a screen, not like not this screen, but like, you know, <laughs> a, curtain, a curtain, right? And the easel hiding behind the curtain. Right, like they, they didn't talk to anybody and they were so shy. And I mean, look, you cannot make somebody shy an extrovert, but if they can sort of like, with the social media world that we are living right now without having to put their faces on that's one way for the shy people to actually put their work out in the world and um I've, you know i have tons of friends who own galleries and they collect artists from instagram left and right the fine artists that they represent on instagram the you know uh it's just like like, I mean, I'm not saying TikTok because a lot of the gallery owners are not there dancing and singing. It's like, not yeah. <laughs> at least Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going to be next, but that is the place. Instagram is the place where galleries go to take a look and to stumble upon, you know, amazing artists that they had never heard before or when they start seeing something repeatedly that they like and yeah. they started going back and checking in and whatnot so i think that there has never been a better time to be an artist than right now because the tools are there the tools are there the marketing tools the marketing platforms are very inexpensive and very easy to use and it's up to you whether you want to use them to grow your business or if you just decide that absolutely not because you're still thinking along the terms and like you know the 19th century yeah. and, you, know, no, you know like i don't understand sometimes you know um i don't obviously i didn't go to art school but art i think that art school is not teaching a lot of things for the practical world Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, when you go to yeah, I mean, you go to school is theory for the most part. I mean, it's like studio art and all those things. Obviously, you have to be painting and doing things and glass critiques and whatnot. But you know, um, one hundred percent necessary to make it in the art world these days. Yeah, yeah. you know, and that's one thing we talk about a lot too. In terms of like, I did go to art school. I went to Virginia Tech. I loved my experience there. Had great opportunities. But I think the one thing is that like art school and i know a lot of other artists and other programs like art school teaches you how to make art how to be a critical thinker the art history but it doesn't teach you how to be a business owner how to be an entrepreneur how to market yourself how to build relationships and network and that is a huge part of being an artist that makes money with their work it's one of those they 
it's more geared towards the academia side or yeah. more traditional gallery representation rather than representing yourself as an artist. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that in terms of kind of that old school, I need to be represented <laughs> by a gallery in order to make it versus maybe just representing myself, having my work on an online website and Instagram. And if artists are able to do both, what your opinions on are on those? Well, I think that you just mentioned something about networking. And um, I don't know if networking is that needed anymore because everything is on a digital world unless you want to do a network event online or something, right? Right. And... Uh, I think it's a lot more about individual desire to put yourself out there and to go and apply all those kind of like entrepreneurial skills, which are not like, here's the deal, like honestly, and this is the foundation really of my book, the artists that I have met who are six figure, seven figure, eight figure, like seriously, are the ones who are the most entrepreneurial and they didn't have a leg up. They were not rich. Nobody, you know, it's not white privilege. It, nobody handed them checks. I mean, none of that, right? These are yeah. people who actually said, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to, you know, uh, and it, it doesn't have to be a room full of people and like, you know, almost like people feel it's going to be corp like one of those like speed dating before networking. It's not <laughs> that. It's not that, right? It is like, I'm going to put myself out there, out there with my ideas. I'm going to put myself out there, out there with my products. Some people started creating like did right like he started creating his own dolls because his work seemed to have gotten this super intense hook in asia and he said well creating dolls is the same process as making sculptures and why can i not just create my dolls and sell them in asia and you know please all these people and sort of like start building a brand and i'm not saying you have to do that but what i'm saying is that there are many ways that artists can actually multiply expand and create their their um their practices and they don't have to be in any room networking as long as they have a computer where they can send an email and a platform whether it is instagram a blog facebook whatever to show what you're making and, yeah. you, know how, and you know how to use hashtags you're probably going to be able to build something of value i worked once um that was probably about uh, 10 years ago, I, I designed an app for kids about the story of Frida Kahlo for children. Nice. Um, and, yeah, and so I, I designed the app, I wrote it. I had a friend who had an app company at the time. So we partnered, but we needed an illustrator. So I found an illustrator and she turns out that she was Venezuelan. So it was like, um, it, she, she was in Brooklyn and I'm in Manhattan. So it was fabulous. So we met. We talk, I mean, I found her online, obviously, looking for some for her, for somebody. And uh, we met for like 10 minutes. She left with a story. And then she presented these incredible watercolors that to die for. Seriously, I couldn't believe how good she was and how she had gotten my whole story. But bottom line is not that. We used this, we digitized the watercolors. The app did amazingly well. Then my friend his company grew up so he keeps he didn't want to keep up updating it but it you know we made, <laughs> whatever, we made a lot of money bottom line is i found the uh this girl the uh, the illustrator about two years ago and she's had a whole huge business that she started out of instagram where she turned her illustrations into plush toys t-shirts onesies nice shoes, you know like the wallpaper and they are so beautiful beautiful i mean like she's making half a million bucks every year out of this right mm -hmm. and she's mm -hmm. she lives in brooklyn she doesn't talk to anybody really because she is shy i'm telling you like when we met she ran from like the meeting like she understood my concept she was very sweet and she's like i have to go and i have not seen that woman ever since been <laughs> seen her right but the thing is she's not showing at a gallery she that's not her dream or if it was then she replaced it with something that still gives her a lot of fulfillment yeah 
that you know she's making a killing really yeah and uh you know and she still doesn't have to go anywhere to network with people right yeah it's almost like digital content creation can surpass and take over the old school version of traditional networking of going with your systems. going with your portfolio under your arm to a gallery which never ends up well probably <laughs> so, uh, no. digital content creation i feel like is the way of doing that which is so powerful and gives so much ownership to the artist too it does obviously need structure and lends more to entrepreneurial skills but it's so within the reach of so many artists Even which is amazing those that are shy so which yeah. is amazing Listen, I, I think that 99 of the victory comes from action really right yeah. or maybe 90 okay let's say let's be fair 90 percent of the victory comes from 90 from the action that you take on what you're doing with your art and your practice because you know there are so many things that people can do apply to you know art fairs like the future art fair or you know spring break that is like curator driven uh, and as also artist driven uh, you know apply for open calls apply for prizes for residencies uh, you know play with things online so that you the right hashtags and people find you and do that consistently every day if possible it sounds like a lot of work sure of course it is everything that has been given to us that is content creation and that requires us to add interactions online our work in fact i discovered the very recent study because this i mean the area of creativity fascinates me and it is about it's a study that has been peer reviewed by it, it, i don't remember the university anymore but it's a university in the united states that measured whether or not social media kills creativity and for people who actually are engaging with their own content image caption whatever it increases it for people who are just consuming it it decreases it right so, so much sense yeah yeah right so being out there it does not require the frightening thing of going to the gallery with your portfolio or going in a room of people that you probably won't want to be in there are, there are people who want to do that but let, we're talking about those who are you know stage fright people who don't you know they don't like this you know yeah they don't want to perform for people they don't want to perform they don't want to mingle but they 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 have to do something nobody's gonna come and knock on the door and say wow you know look i had a, a student once in one of my courses and um she's an excellent photographer and photography has had you know ups and downs and lately it has been a little bit on the down because painting is what people want but that doesn't mean photography is over it means that there are ups and downs and moments in life right yeah. so she she's an excellent excellent photographer i have you know like all the respect for what she was doing but she's like well and when is my big solo show gonna come and i say why are you not putting this on etsy mm -hmm. right? like what what's what is preventing you right oh, well because this and that and i said but you know you need to have some sort of wins to begin with right yeah and i think that because your work is great and you know you can actually get some help to if you need to create that you know and, and like that you know website page whatever on etsy and uh, you know use the tag you know the words and, and this and that so she ended up sort of like putting them there but then at the same time she was taking action then she found other places where she also could uh, associate themselves with her with them and so opportunities were coming for her because she was not crying in the room like with the prior mentality is like where's my big solo show right mm -hmm. and uh, but she's like okay if people are going to start building you know like momentum for me because they are going to appreciate my work and they are going to buy it and that's going to give me a sensation and a feeling that i am in the right direction that i'm moving forward i'm making people happy because they have their prints in my prints in their house that is where people have to position themselves and not just like what about my big retrospective at the whitney right? <laughs> that means like a, i'm like that's 
that's what I'm saying before. You can't be delusional. There's, there's like, and, and the fine line that I said before, what is talent? What is creativity? How are you utilizing your ideas, right? Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I think it's so much of that, of it's momentum building. And every decision that you make as an artist is not going to be the best decision ever and catapult you to a new level. Some may be missteps. Some may lead you in a path that you didn't even think about, but it's all part of gaining that momentum and gaining that confidence. Um, but real quick, aside from lack of action, is there any type of step or direction that you have seen artists take that you would say is more harmful than helpful in their process or you no know, i think that artists sometimes they approach people me all their friends in the business and galleries and whatnot saying you have to help me you know can you please help me put like my art out in the world you know what mm -hmm. i mean and i think that that is not the right way I think usually if you want to build a relationship with someone whom you are expecting them to help you, either you offer to do something for them, because, mm -hmm. you know, usually the point here, the, the mentality at least, the mentality at least should be, what can I do to help this person rather than what can they do to help me, right? I think that yeah. uh, we have lost manners, obviously, forget about that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I think also like the immediacy of social media and how you can reach everybody through a DM has also made people so informal, right? Yeah. That uh, that they that they think like you know, hey, it's like if I am going to send a DM or a message to my best friend, I can say, hey, yo, can you help me because I have this problem, right? But not to somebody I've never even crossed my paths with, right? Like, right, and. And so I think that's a no for sure, you know, that many artists do, and it's just not appropriate. Um, I also think that, you know, if a gallery be very, uh, you know, disciplined in your research, right, of what you want to do, and if you want to really show with galleries, do a lot of research, see what they show and how they if they accept submissions is usually online and please just go and check everything before you start sending you know boxes and you know trucks with things and uh, you know because like <laughs> honestly that's only going to that actually does not cause momentum it actually makes things worse for you because you will have to pay for all those, you know, shipments and whatever, you're probably never going to get that back because they are going to just throw it in the garbage. And that's mm -hmm. the truth. And I think that there are other ways. For example, what if you invite the local gallery to come to your studio to, you know, have a coffee and take a look at what you do? What if you say, you know, let's grab lunch together? What starting the whole thing with building a relationship i I've, I've known people who actually have gone a very long way with this approach and uh it has sort of like worked out for them because even, even if it doesn't if it if it's not that gallery that person would have felt it's going to feel compelled to say you know but i have this friend who works here or you know what let me just kiss Listen, we are in a, the, the art world is vast and not. We all really know each other. And it's generally a group of people who, not everybody, I have to say, but generally speaking, it's a group of people who are excited about new talents and want to help other artists succeed. And I also want to help my gallery friends to make more money. And so it's all a, an ecosystem that feeds off of each other right and depends on each other's moves so if if there is an artist with some talent and i appreciate that we have built even a small connection a small relationship and i can introduce that person to somebody else who like, i mean i'm going to do that for sure mm -hmm. for sure there's no reason why I, I will not other people are too busy to go to lunches or to build relationships but they could probably stop by the studio if they are interested in or they are intrigued so uh, i think that having those little touches 
is always a whole lot more helpful than this super aggressive, can you help me? You yeah. Know? Yeah, I actually have a follow-up question with that. Um, there's another artist who's coming. I'm trying to think of the interview will come out before yours or after yours. Before. Before. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be near you where we had a similar discussion about reaching out to galleries and not asking for anything, simply saying, here's my work. Um, would you say from your experience, you know, in terms of building that relationship, you know, for those listeners that are saying, okay, that's great, but how do I even get started, right? To say, a, sending some kind of intro, an intro email to say, hi, this is my name, this is where I'm from, like tiny little blurb about your story, and then perhaps attaching either images of the work or maybe a catalog or, or series of work, some kind of PDF and saying, you know, hey, if you want to talk more, great, if not, have a wonderful day, and would you say that's like sufficient to like at least plant that seed? Yes, I think that's the the way to go to have that initial contact that is not seven pages of an email, right? But it's just like three three words, a link maybe, or little you know maybe little JPEGs attached to see where that gets you. And you know you can follow up. Maybe you can follow up a week or two after if you don't hear back. Well, you know that was not for you, right? Yeah. Because you also never know, too, where like where that planted seed will hit. And of course, respecting everyone as busy humans, you don't know what their schedule looked like that day, what meeting they got called into, what personal family life thing they have going on. So even understanding that by sending an email, even if you don't get a response, you don't know if they'll be emailing you back three months from now because they're like, I remember this image that you sent me and it would really stick out for this upcoming exhibition mm -hmm. we're doing and then it starts the conversation yeah, and i also think that it's um, important what i said before about doing the research right look at right. The, the type of artist this person shows or this gallery shows is there a fit right it, it, does it look a little bit like you do the backgrounds of those people match yours i think that's like it's the minimum I think that an artist should be doing is researching with depth. Yeah. <laughs> why, right? Like, why is this a good place for you? And why would they actually, you know, be interested in your work? Exactly. I think especially if you're doing individual galleries, if they're known for super detailed oil landscapes and portraiture, a lot of <laughs> neutral colors, don't necessarily put your abstract, colorful, <laughs> geometric work in an email to them. Like, and because I think that alone might do more harm than good in their eyes as yes. they didn't even do the common courtesy of a basic aesthetic fit, unless they're going through a total rebrand one day. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's it's it's what you said is perfect but also there are so many platforms right now for artists that are online as well so many that i can't even name them because no seriously it's insane how these places seeing that there are so many great artists like sachi you know started there right like started with that type of thing and now there are like millions of others um you know that keep reproducing and the artists are incredible and again like etsy still has an enormous amount of great artists who found their niche there and they are making money and they're like i don't really need to go i mean i remember this woman who she uh, creates things on crochet uh and funny things and madonna found her and posted all her crochets on instagram and the girls thing blew up i mean like like That's amazing. You have no idea right i mean and the girl's still showing her little crochets on um on on etsy and i think that she can't keep up right and uh and it, it's it's the, you know it's one and how did madonna found her because the girl had a whole page on instagram with every day it's it's like a funny thing it's a little bit of, you know, a, a parody on things and, you know, dark humor and whatever. Yeah, I think I've seen that page before. Right? And so, yeah. the, what, and, and two things. 
one is the girl was putting herself out there with the work it was not her face she was not in her working with anybody and the second thing is that girl was willing to be herself this is who she was it was funny it was dark sometimes maybe even dirty but she was like this i can do whatever i want because right. i'm an artist and artists have such poetic licenses too right they can get away with everything because it's art and there are not many other places uh, or professions where you can get away with everything just because it's art i mean if you have a urinal making a stir let's be just because it was anything goes, anything goes a banana duct tape tool you Said it. You have said it. You have said it. And you now you have <laughs> NFTs. You have somebody who got paid sixty nine million dollars to deliver a file that can be downloaded for free on the internet. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Get, a crazy place. Artists can get away with anything. Yeah. Well, that's actually a perfect bridge. So, artists being creative, thinking out of the box. That sounds like a lot of that is in your book. So tell us a little yes. bit more about, it's called How Creativity Rules the World, The Art and Business of Turning Your Ideas into Gold. So tell us a little bit more about that because I think this is just the perfect tie-in. Yeah, well, you know, this book obviously has been 14 years in the making basically since I opened the business because since I came from like, the barren world of being an attorney i became obsessed with the topic of creativity and creativity not just as arts and crafts and cutouts and those things which are obviously very creative but but as an overall creativity and business and science and you know any field because i realized that the more i hung up with artists the better i got in my business because your subconscious absorbs everything and you end up getting so many more ideas and not just artists look i mean everything that i do i try to figure out if there is a way of value for me like i love movies and i go to the movies once a week sometimes even twice because i absolutely love film as a genre and everything from blockbusters to like art house and how those things have impacted my life i can't not necessarily tell you and because i went to see this foreign movie this business came out of it but i can <laughs> tell you that there is a correlation with it between how ideas happen and what the things that you consume uh, you know in in your daily life but the book is basically the culmination of this 13 years and how i was able to see patterns in the most successful artists that i have worked with and how i connected those patterns to artists or inventors from the past in history from the things that we have seen and also how artists and entrepreneurs share the same mindsets and habits and skills and so this book is divided into four parts the four, the first part is all about enlightening your creativity your business seeing where the ideas come from and also like breaking all those myths about creativity like it's genetic or it just came to you like you know it was a god-given thing and um you know you were so lucky that you received it from the gods and that is not true and i actually set out to not only present the myths but bring you the science because that's like for the skepticals right like oh, who that's she amazing she is, right? like, so i'm also connecting with uh, all the research from reputable universities and psychologists who actually debunk the myths of the creativity that comes from the gods and and again remember what i said before between talent and creativity if you have like you know someone who is a singer a dancer that has that ability that's kind of like a talent creativity is how you utilize it and just to go back to madonna she's not a singer this woman is just a massively creatively talented person who was willing to take every risk and she had a desire to be entrepreneurial and to use what she had which is not her voice to build a business right i mean a humongous business and whatever it is and she is right now in her career has nothing to do with where she was at the beginning right but it's an example of what talent and creativity are so different so the second part of the book is all about habits and so why creativity is so stimulated 
right by artists is because they are willing to do things that people otherwise wouldn't do because they can't get away with things so it's like this ability to be authentic the ability to take risks the ability to empathize because also from a standpoint of a consumer when people who are not in the arts are reading this book they will understand how to see things from a different perspective and that's so important nothing that is a big breakthrough nothing that is disruptive comes from business as usual it comes from things that are so unique and things that happen in the intersections of two or more industries or disciplines things that happen on the margins on the fringes that's like the beauty also of being an artist is that they are willing to explore yeah the, you know the the kind of like the things that are not just obvious right yeah they're willing to sit within those moments that are uncomfortable and yes them. yes and see what is in there to materialize right in art and the third part is all about how materialize, you know, how to materialize these ideas and how to put them together and how to bring them to fruition to reality so that they don't just stay in your mind. Because that's the other thing is that a lot of artists have enormously fantastic ideas and they never come out of their heads. And that's a shame and it's a problem, you know, because you never know where the next big hit is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, although it is very important to edit your ideas, it's also important or more to get them out first, right? And to actually see them in reality. And the last part is about connecting all these dots and seeing the future. I think also the most successful artists that I've met they don't have like this God-given talent that people claim that comes from, you know, the gods and whatnot, <laughs> but, but more people who are very attuned to both their stories and the present and that is how they can see the future because the future is obviously embedded in in the present and we are responsible for making the new future and the new things every day and to be able to do that that means you have to know what's happening around you and that means you have to pay attention that means that you have to give up on some of like your favorite distractions every day so that you have time to appreciate what is brewing what's happening in your surroundings and things like that and i think for the most part every artist that i have visited in my life has a very silent practice it's it's always you know very quiet and uh, even if they have assistance, maybe you hear some background music at a low volume, but it's not like a trading floor, right? Where like men and women are screaming and like, oh, you know, or, right. and, <laughs> it's very it's, introspective. <laughs> it's very introspective. And that's why everybody should learn something from artists who spend so much time in silence because this is the realm of possibility when you are with yourself and you're thinking intently about something that's where you find your greatest ideas your best inspiration the the aha moments that this is what i'm going to do next right but if you're constantly drowned with sounds and images and you know stimulation and tactile and whatever it's just so much right yeah. and uh, that that really strangles your creative mind and it doesn't leave room for other things to flourish it's so I true that. i yeah uh, i absolutely love that i want like we'll be pulling quotes from this for sure <laughs> and putting it on our studio walls of yeah just like being comfortable sitting in that silence and moments it'll be comforting some moments it'll be uncomfortable but both are equally important of letting those visions come to life so you're not overstimulated by media and distractions and really just sitting with your process i love that yeah and that perfectly ties in with all these scientific studies that have been coming out about the benefits of meditation where yes. you're sitting quiet you're letting those ideas come in and then from there you kind of filter essentially what is going to be born on the canvas or whatever the medium or substrate is for that artist for that creative 
versus what do you put on the back burner. So there's that discernment too, but you do have to go through that time. And for a lot of artists, at least I'm speaking for myself, meditation is painting is when you're in that flow in that creative where you're letting the muse or whatever you want to call it kind of just go through you almost like a medium without sounding woo woo, but um, you're just letting it all move through you. And then you decide, you know, I mean, it's a million decisions for every painting, for every piece you're creating, but you're kind of letting it all flood you in first without overwhelming you. And then you just kind of funnel it from there where it goes. So I absolutely love what you're saying because for a lot of people, they're like, you just sit there and you wait. And it's like, no, you don't. You got to open, the, <laughs> let it all come in, or at least have that habit of, I need to sit here in quiet and meditation and trying to get into the flow and it will come, but you, you have to show up first. So you have to, and actually I have a whole chapter on silence. Uh, and, and obviously for people who are not artists, this it sounds sometimes a little like foreign to them. And that's why I recommend to those people to meditate every day. But very well said what you just mentioned. For many painters and artists, their meditation is being immersed in what they are doing because it requires presence, mindfulness, which is being in the here and now, and silence. So for a lot of people who are not artists, that seems like a luxury to have, right? And sometimes right. it's not even that. Sometimes it's not even a luxury. Sometimes it's just that they don't want to because people have been conditioned to having a phone with them where they Obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, smartphones are miraculous, right? But they are, have the news, the tweets, the emails, the notifications, the, you know, alarm, go do this. Go. And so if you put that away, it's an addiction because those are dopamine hits that keep your brain all the time, like on the high thing of like the expectation of the next thing to see if that next thing is exciting enough or not, right? And right. once you've gone into that loop, you have to break it with, you know, separation from the technology for a little bit and having those moments, for example, when you are painting or drawing or thinking or just looking outside of your window with nothing else to say or do. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I am so excited to be able to get your book by the time this episode is live. It will be available. So before we wrap up with some of our final questions that we talk to all of our guests about, why don't you go ahead and share where people can get the book today, yes. March 15th, 2022. <laughs> Yay. Well, so How Creativity Rules the World by Maria Brito is on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Andy Bound. Walmart, Target, and, it, you know, basically all the independent bookstores, which I would love for you guys to support. They are so important. But if you want it now, immediately, please just go ahead and order it from uh, also Bookshop. That um, Bookshop.org benefits all the the independent bookstores, depending on oh, your amazing. area. Yeah. So if you, it, it's state by state. So when you open bookshop.org in North Carolina, it shows you that you can order it immediately, but it will benefit the bookstores that are closest to you. And same, like if you are in, you know, Reno, Nevada, same thing. Like it will just bring the money to those bookstores. So bookshop.org is a very important resource if you cannot physically go to places. So uh, yes, so it's it's available in all those places. It's published by HarperCollins and I can't wait for you guys to have it. Let me know, send me a note how the book helped you. I have this intention that this book is really going to help so many people change the way they see business and creativity and entrepreneurship and artistry because we just cannot afford to be one thing anymore. Like the one thing person is the one trick pony, you know, like it just can't yeah. be. So, you know, we, we are in a world that demands that we embrace all these things. Uh, it's not my decision that the world changed this way. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to bridge the gap between where people think that, you know, what they can actually contribute to their practices, careers, and what actually is necessary. So I think this book will really bridge that gap. 
Yes, that's amazing. And as our listeners know, all of the links that we just mentioned will be in the show notes as well as our individual blogs and Maria's contact information. And real quick, before we let you go with the rest of your day, we do have three questions that we ask all of our guests. So how would you just define success as an art professional in the modern age? I think that once you're able to live comfortably off of your art and uh, or whatever it is that you do in, you know, the art world, you have definitely reached success because it is a privilege really to be able to do something as fantastic as impacting people, whether you are the one who's making the art or you are the one who's selling it or you are the one who is doing both or you are the one who works, you know, at a museum and is helping these exhibitions bring these ideas to masses of people. I think that it is a phenomenal career that shapes ideas, shapes the world, and it's a culture making activity that you know can change you know history in the long in the long term so i think it's uh that is to me the definition of success i absolutely love that and from your end uh what is one piece of advice that you wish you would have heard before you started your creative journey so maybe somewhere uh before you made the leap from law firm Mm -hmm. onto this you know art professional career? What's one thing you wish you would have heard before you pulled the trigger? I think that, you know, maybe it's better not to hear too many things because everybody's going to tell you Mm -hmm. their point of view and people, even if they are well-meaning, they tend to project their own things onto you. Their, you know, shortcomings, their failures, their fears, their jealousies, whatever. So I think it's better not to listen to anything and um, just go ahead and do your thing. I mean, there are there are things that you're going to listen, right? Like good advice. How you do this? How do you show up, you know, in a gallery? How do you reach out? Yes, that, that kind of thing I hope you're listening to. But I don't know. I don't have those kind of hang ups because truly everything that has happened has been for me to learn something. And if I somebody would have told me, listen, experience is obviously individual, but experience, the word experience is living something, right? And so mm-hmm. if if somebody would have told me a piece of information that well-intentioned probably would have like said, do this or don't do that, I would have never possibly known until I actually was in a situation where I needed that or I didn't need it, right? Yeah. So I don't I don't want to sound like too that I'm not giving you the answer that you want. But I think that, <laughs> that's that's the answer. It's that it's it's okay not to listen to things, you know. Yeah, and that's okay. I think in a kind of in a nutshell, what I'm gathering from that is essentially to take it with a grain of salt is what I'm getting out of you in terms of that advice of like. Yes, it'll come in, but then have that discernment to say, okay, does this serve me or doesn't it? If it doesn't serve me, bye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs> and also like listening to that authentic voice as we started our conversation with, like as artists, being able to trust your story, trust your experience, trust if you see a hole that needs to be explored in a conversation that people might not be able to give you advice in that area because no one's gone there. And maybe that's a reason why you're seeing that and why you're meant to be the one exploring it, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So last question, um, more of a fun question. If you were to have a hundred dollars right now to splurge on something or invest in, um, what would it be? So it has to be something that brings you joy and is related to the art world or your art business? Well, girl, with a hundred bucks, what do you buy these days? I don't know. I guess it would be an, <laughs> N- an NFT, I guess. I mean, like, you know, and, and that's with good luck, right? Like with that's true. With do we need to adjust it for New York prices? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you get with 100 bucks right now? I don't know. That's, I mean, unless I buy my own paints and create my own thing, right? I mean, that could be it, right? But I still, I, 
could, could I buy a small canvas and some paints with underbox? I don't yes. even. Yeah. Okay. So then that's what I would do because, <laughs> and I'll do, and I'll do my own thing. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I know what we will be spending it on is a couple of versions of your book because and art supplies. I, yes, and art supplies, of course, <laughs> because we are so excited. And thank you so much for coming on today's podcast. We've loved talking to you and we know that our listeners have immensely benefited from hearing all of your advice and experience. So thank you so much. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much for giving us this different perspective. Um, because again, of course, as artists, we're always curious to hear kind of the other side too, the art professional side of the world. Like, yes, we'll talk to other artists, but you just gave us a little bit more insight from the quote unquote other side of art world, <laughs> capital A, all of this with air quotes for those that can't see the video and are listening to this on the podcast. So we are very, very appreciative that you basically opened the doors to your side of the professional practice and you were so generous in your advice. Thank you so well, much. Well, uh, thank you, Jackie and Adriana. It's my pleasure. I really loved getting to do this with both of you. I think it's an amazing labor of love what you're doing with this podcast. And we need more people like you to put together these ideas to encourage people to mm -hmm. dig and to find their best creative selves and to bring that to the world. Because you never know. You really never know when and and how you're going to you know hit that jackpot and and find your bliss accompanied with money right it's very important yes so. exactly so for our listeners again information will be in the show notes but where can they find you and stay in contact with you maybe yes. share some tidbits of what they learned after today's conversation absolutely uh my website is maria .com. that's b-r-i-t-o.com and there are links to twitter facebook linkedin and instagram where people can find me and uh, there is also a form for emails so if you want to email me that is on my website there is also a link to my weekly newsletter that you can sign up for free so um you know that's actually the hub where everything is concentrated so i don't have to give you five thousand names of things <laughs> <laughs> nice and easy and streamlined yeah. we love yes. it. <laughs> that's actually perfect well like jackie said we're gonna have everything in the show notes and then for our listeners if you want to stay connected with us uh in between episodes maybe share what you've learned uh, share some of the information and what was most helpful about what was discussed in this episode. You can find us on social media, uh, Omega May Art across all platforms. And I'm at Jay Sanders Studio on all platforms. So thank you so much for listening and we'll talk to you next week.